All right, so we're going to start out with anemias. Um, and of course, anemia is something that as an internist, you see a lot. Um, pretty much every patient that walks in your door uh, a lot of times is anemic. So something that you need to know, you need to uh, remember, and you need to know how to work up an anemia. So by definition, anemia, of course, means anybody that has a lower than normal hemoglobin and hematocrit. Um, you need to look at your tables. All labs are a little different, um, and remember that they differ between men and women because men are usually a little bit higher. Um, but you need to look at what your norms are for your lab. Uh, remember that people become anemic for lots of different reasons. They become anemic because the bone marrow quits producing. So it quits producing because it's deficient in something or because something else is going on in the bone marrow prohibiting it from uh, producing red cells or you become anemic because you destroy those red cells after you make them, or you become anemic because you lose them after you make them. And that's probably the most common thing that as an internist you would see. Um, when we work up an anemia, we work it up with lots of different tools, but the primary ones that you'll see focused on are the reticulocyte count, which helps you know if the marrow is capable of production, the indices and the RDW, which help you know uh, whether you've got a small cells with not much hemoglobin, larger cells with lots of hemoglobin, uh, and then looking at the peripheral smear, because a lot of times the peripheral smear will give you lots of clues as to what's going on and causing your anemia. All right, so we're going to start out with a case. 62-year-old has diabetes and rheumatoid arthritis and comes in with fatigue and anemia. She has a hemoglobin of 8 and a hematocrit of 25%. She has an MCV of 79. The best test to evaluate this anemia would include... A, a ferritin and serum iron, B, a ferritin and a total iron binding capacity, C, a percent iron saturation, or D, a ferritin and a soluble transferrin receptor. Okay, so go. Okay, so kind of smattering across the board there, huh? All right, um, so 42% went for a ferritin in the total iron binding capacity. 33% went for ferritin and soluble transferrin. And, you know, basically when you order iron studies, you get all of those tests, right? So, you know, not one or two of them do you use. But if I had to just pick two of those, I would have picked the last two. So ferritin and a soluble transferrin receptor. And we'll kind of talk about why as we go, okay? All right, so you get your iron, your studies back. And the iron is 30 Iron binding capacity is 300, the percent saturation is 10%, the ferritin is 30, and the soluble transferrin receptor is 2.6. So the most likely cause of this anemia, given those specific numbers, would be iron deficiency, beta thalassemia, anemia of chronic disease, or folate deficiency. Very good. So not many people thought it was beta thal or folate. So we're between anemia of chronic disease and iron deficiency, and the majority of people thought iron deficiency. So, um, and indeed this is iron deficiency. Okay, and we'll go over all these numbers as we go. So iron deficiency would be the most common cause of an anemia. Uh, should be the first thing that you think about. Generally iron deficiency is secondary to loss of uh, red cells or occasionally an insufficient intake from your diet. Um, uh, vegetarians occasionally will get uh, iron deficient. Or secondary to a malabsorption syndrome. Pa patients with Crohn's, uh, some of the inflammatory bowel diseases may actually have uh, malabsorption. Pregnancy, almost always iron deficient. Um, and remember that when you diagnose somebody with iron deficiency, you can't just leave it at that. You've got to actually go that step further and figure out why they're iron deficient because you can't leave them with just that diagnosis. Hence, that you're looking at somebody that's iron deficient as a cause of their anemia would be what their cells look like, their size. So they'd be microcytic, they'd be small, they'd be hypochromic, they wouldn't have much uh, hemoglobin in them. You have an elevated RDW, you usually have a decreased reticulocyte count because the marrow doesn't have enough iron to make the cells, and then occasionally you have that elevated platelet count. So remember that secondary thrombocytosis occasionally with iron deficiency. And this is just a picture of what they look like, and um, you can see these cells. Uh, this is a good example. This is a good example. Um, the cells are small. That's actually a platelet fragment, so you can tell by looking at the size there. They're small, and they don't have much hemoglobin in them, just a very small rim of hemoglobin. 
Okay, so the lab test that you see with iron deficiency, you need to just memorize these patterns. You've got to know what they are. You're going to have an iron deficiency and anemia chronic disease on the board. I can almost guarantee it. So know what the patterns are. So for iron deficiency, your iron should be low. Your iron binding capacity should be high. Your percent saturation should be low. And your ferritin technically should be low as well. But remember, remember what is ferritin? It's an acute phase reactant. So ferritin will fool you sometimes, okay? So remember that ferritin is not always your best judge, although it is the best judge we have of iron stores. Um, sometimes it can fool you, okay? Um, the soluble transferrin receptor assay we mentioned earlier also will help you in differentiating. The primary thing you need to remember is that it should be elevated if you have iron deficiency anemia. It is a receptor. It's trying to bind iron. If you don't have enough iron, it's going to make more receptors, so you're going to have a higher level, okay? So it should be elevated if you have iron deficiency. Remember that the gold standard for iron, if you have the option, is always a bone marrow. That's going to tell you, without a doubt, what your iron stores are. Not many people are going to volunteer for a bone marrow test just to see what their iron stores are. But if you can't tell and you've got to know, that is the one way for sure that you can tell us by looking at the marrow. So what do you do if you diagnose somebody with iron deficiency? Well, we already said the first thing. You identify why they're iron deficient because you've got to fix that. And you don't want to miss that colon cancer that's just leaking a little bit or that ulcer that's just leaking a bit or that gastric cancer. Um, so you've got to find out why. And once you determine why they're iron deficient, you've also got to fix their iron deficiency. So you've got to replace their iron. We usually use oral iron replacement um, that's just as effective as using IM or IV. Uh, usually you need about 200 to 250 milligrams of elemental iron a day to replete your stores. You want to replace them until their hematocrit normalizes. And then once they normalize, you usually need to replace about six more months to replace your stores. So generally until you get a normal crit and then six more months, if you have fixed why they're losing, iron, um, losing blood, if they're still bleeding and still losing, you're going to need to return um, to replace a lot longer. You can use IV or IM replacement if you want to or need to, if you've got somebody that's intolerant of, IV, of oral iron or somebody that just won't take it or, you know, for whatever reason. But just remember that the main risk to giving somebody IV or IM iron is that they may anaphylax on you, and it's not pretty, doesn't it? It's not pretty. So uh, just remember that, and remember if you're going to do IV or IM, you need to do a test dose and you need to have on hand things for anaphylaxis like epinephrine.